saying is financially frugal. <laughs> Around our house, we spell that C-H-E-A-P. He's most generous if somebody else needs help. You know that. But on himself, he will not spend it. I booked my first speech in Hawaii, or as we say around here, Hawaii. <laughs> we were so excited. We had never been there. I didn't know what they were going to wear. I took all my clothes, had them ready to go. We were going to cash in points and stay at the Sheraton at Waikiki Beach an extra week. Had an airline ticket. It was wonderful. The only problem we had was that I was to leave home, go to Minnesota, make a speech, and fly to Honolulu from there. Left Brain couldn't go with me that day. He had to come the day I would be flying, but he had to fly from North Carolina, and he was going to bring the luggage. <laughs> when will I learn? <laughs> the client called the day that I was leaving and said, Jeannie, I forgot to get gifts for the spouses in our group. Is there any way that you can get 150 of your hardback books to Hawaii. I said, that's no problem. I'll tell you they're hardback only so you know how heavy this was. I said, my husband will bring them with the luggage. Hung up and I said to Jerry, you got to take with all this bags and stuff, you got to take these seven cases of books with you to the airport. The airlines will ship them, but you're going to have to pay extra per box. Just pay whatever they want, get these books to Hawaii. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute, pay whatever they want. <laughs> There's got to be a better way than that. <laughs> and you understand with left brain that a better way is synonymous with a cheaper way. He worked on his better way all afternoon. He went up into the attic, got six of the biggest suitcases you have ever seen. I didn't even know they were up there. No wheels on them. One of them was a trunk I took to Auburn with me as a freshman. <laughs> He took the books out of carefully packaged cases, wrapped each book individually in t-shirts, shorts, underwear, <laughs> shirts, packed all these bags back. And when he finished, all of our clothes were wadded up around these 150 books. And they're in these bags that he shut up that you couldn't even pick up. I just looked at him and I said, well, I, I wouldn't have done it that way, but I'll, I'll see you in Hawaii. He said, wait a minute, you're the one that travels all the time. How am I going to get these bags from the airport to the Sheraton at Waikiki Beach? I said, that's easy. You just somehow get them to the curb. You get in a cab and just say, take me to the Sheraton at Waikiki Beach. He said, how much do you think that cab's going to cost? Why would it matter? You would have just flown 10 hours. Your body, Jerry, will think it is the next day. Pay him, get to the hotel. He said, what does it say in the little book? He had been over to the May Memorial Library, checked out a book on how to see Hawaii on $23.42 a day. <laughs> I looked it up. Honolulu Airport to the hotels at Waikiki Beach, $20 plus a tip. $20? got to be a better way than that. I said, well, honey, you could go on the shuttle, but I've, I'm going to tell you from experience, you'll have to wait after that long trip for the shuttle to fill up. And then you're going to have to go to every hotel that somebody is stopping at. And you're going to get there two hours before I do, but it'll take you all that time to get the, what does the little book say about the shuttle? Eight dollars, be a smaller tip. He said, I bet there's a better way than that. I said, I bet I will just see you in Hawaii. <laughs> Aloha. <laughs> the next day I gave my speech in Minnesota. I had one little rolling cart. I flew to Hawaii, got off with my one little rolling cart, went straight to the curb and got in a cab. <laughs> said, here's your $20 and here's your tip. Take me to the Sheraton at Waikiki Beach. I was checking in. And I just asked the man behind the desk one question, and you would have thought <laughs> I had taken a pail of ice water and thrown it in his face. All I said was, has my husband checked in yet? 
He backed up and raised his voice, I thought, for the benefit of the bellman standing over there, and he turned into an Elvis announcer. Mr. Robertson is in the building. <laughs> I thought that sounded a little bit strange, but I went up and I unlocked the door and there stood Jerry, dripping wet. Bags everywhere, golf clubs all over the room. He said, I just got here, aloha. <laughs> what happened, honey? Was your plane late? Plane ran right on time. It took me two hours to get from the airport to this hotel with these bags. Well, what happened? Did the cab get caught in traffic? I didn't come in a cab. <laughs> I found a better way. I said, you came on that shuttle and you went around from hotel to hotel for two hours. He said, I didn't come on the shuttle either. I came on the city bus. <laughs> One dollar, no tip. <laughs> now this might be a male-female thing. The women will have to tell me, this irritated me. <laughs> I was not the one who did it, but this just irritated me. I said, I'm worn out, honey. Let's just go get something to eat and go to bed. He said, I found a place in the little book. <laughs> we passed six nice restaurants in this hotel to go three blocks away to Denny's. <laughs> I heard a comedian say, people don't go to Denny's, people wind up at Denny's. <laughs> that is not true. We go to Denny's. We seek Denny's. We have a satellite global thing on our car that pulls us in to Denny's. But when we passed the bellman, one of them said, everything all right now, Mr. Robertson? It's a strange thing for a bellman to say. We ate and got back upstairs, and I said, honey, I got to go down to the gift shop and get something. I went down there and went up to the bell stand, the man there working. I said, excuse me, do you remember me? Yes, Mrs. Robertson, what can I do for you? I want to know what my husband did. <laughs> nothing, not a thing, nothing. No, I said, let me make sure you understand. We love each other dearly. We are best friends, but I just sense I'm missing something here. <laughs> He said, Mrs. Robertson, are you aware that your husband came from the airport to this hotel with all that luggage on the city bus? <laughs> I said, yes, I am. One dollar, no tip. <laughs> he said, but Mrs. Robertson, are you aware that the city bus doesn't come to the Sheraton? <laughs> The city bus stops two long blocks around that corner. He said, a bunch of us were up here, tourists everywhere, and we saw a man, your husband, come around the corner with golf clubs on his shoulder, carrying two bags, almost stumbling under the weight of the bags. People up here said, look at that. Wonder where he's going. You think he's coming here? One woman says, is it a homeless person? He put those bags down and went and completely disappeared from sight. We watched the bags and in a few minutes, he came back around the corner with two more bags, put them down and turned to leave. Another bellman stepped up and said, but he never let those golf clubs out of his sight. <laughs> this time he disappeared and didn't come back for a long time. And when he did, he was dragging a trunk had another suitcase, bags, and when he got to the first four, he sidestepped and went on a little further and put them down and kept repeating the process <laughs> till he got to the end of the first block and looked up here. We said, he is coming to the Sheraton. <laughs> we went down to try to help him, but when we got 10 feet from him, he said, I can get it, I've got these bags. I don't need any help. No, no, I got them this far. The bellman said, Mrs. Robertson, could it have been that your husband didn't want to tip? <laughs> Duh! <laughs> A better wife would have not mentioned it. I went straight upstairs. <laughs> what you gonna do with the $19, honey? Go to Europe? I was most, I kept saying all week, $19 in his pocket. $19. Finally, after about five days, he said, all right, now that's enough. 
I did save $19. He said, you weren't going to be here for two hours anyway, and I met some interesting people on the bus. <laughs> Wouldn't you have loved to know what they said that night at supper? <laughs> but then he said, maybe the funniest thing I've ever heard left brain say. And this is what reminds me that things are just not going to change. I'm not and he's not. Because with complete sincerity, he said, it'll be easier going home because the bags won't be as heavy and there'll be two of us to take them down to the bus stop. <laughs> no. to look for the humor around us every day. Left Brain and I wound up in Nanaimo, Canada, about a year ago. We had five hours to kill before we took the ferry. We went straight to the visitor's bureau and I said, we've got a rental car for five more hours. Young woman sitting there, you know, young, these wonderful, smart Elon students here. They know I don't really am talking about them. This was another caliber person here. She's <laughs> sitting right there. And I said, what would you suggest that we do for five hours? And she said, well, pulled out some flyers and some brochures. And she said, oh, I know what. Pointed to the map and said, if you'll go back to the the terminal ferry area right down the street and go south for thir 13 kilometers, you'll come to the Nanaimo River, named after the town. I said, all right. She said, and just go a little further and you'll find the Nanaimo man-made bridge. I said, named after the town and the river. She said, that's right. <laughs> and if you'll go out there right now, you can bungee jump. <laughs> Have you ever wanted to take a young person's face in your hands and say lovingly, are you in there? Are you in there? Look at us. Just look at us. Left brain at that time was 68 years old. Thin, solid white hair, also thin. I was 62 years old, not as thin as I once was, and my hair is Clairol Tweed number 14. <laughs> We don't look like we would bungee jump. But I knew that left brain didn't know what she was talking about. Because when you've been married a long time, you know who the other one knows, what they know. I think we know those, but you don't know those people. I'm telling you that. Or you, don't, you don't know those people. So I said, do you know what she's talking about? Left brain said, I'm not, I'm not sure I do. What she wants us to do, honey, go out to that, to that river and get on that bridge and put on some kind of boots with ropes and things on them. And then when we're secure, we go to the edge of that bridge and we hurl our body off that and we hang upside down. She said 140 feet, thank you. We're gonna drop 140 feet and we're gonna hang there until somebody reels us up. Left brain said, I can't do that. My teeth will fall out. <laughs> this young person, a well intended, said, oh no, sir. There's somebody up on the bridge and before you jump, they'll always have the people take out their hearing aids and their teeth and their... <laughs> Beam me up, Scotty. Wait a minute. Just wait a minute. How many people do you have that come out there and before they jump, first have to put their teeth and their hearing aid in? What do you say? Put your three-prong walker against a tree? <laughs> well, she was almost defensive and she because we were laughing and she said, well, you get your money's worth because you do a whole lot more than just hang there. She said, because when you pop, 
that bungee cord springs you way over here and then over here. And it's like a pendulum. You go back. It's, it's a ride, she said, until finally you stop so you get your money's worth. Let Frank said, I'll tell you what, <laughs> I, I don't want to do it, honey, but we got to go out there and see it. And when she heard see it, her eyes got as big as plates. She said, oh, oh, if you just want to see it, you should come back the weekend after Valentine's Day. That's when they raise money for charities and people jump in the nude. <laughs> said, what'd she say? <laughs> naked. She wants us to jump naked. In Canada in February, we gonna come up here and jump naked. We started laughing so much. Finally, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, left brain. We missing the whole boat here. This might be a good thing with all the sagging areas on our bodies. If we could hang there long enough naked, we might could knock a few things back in place. <laughs> and he said, no, no, we, we can't do that because of that swinging part. <laughs> With all the sagging areas on our body, we liable to start rolling and slap ourselves silly. <laughs> we we could barely get out of the building. We got outside and left Frank just as serious. Oh, honey, I love you so much, but you were just as serious. She said, I'll tell you, I do want to ride out there and see it, but I'll guarantee you, you're never going to get me to spongy jump. <laughs> right there. Right there. It's why I laughed so hard my water broke and I wasn't even pregnant. <laughs> what happened? In our area of the country, as you know, when someone we know gets sick or has passed, that's the way we do it. Have you noticed it? If we hear the word past, we, we... And then we go on. I was seated next to a woman on the airplane and not a month or two ago, she was 70 and going to see her sister. I'd never met her. And I said to her, how many siblings do you have? She said, I have two sisters. And then we had a third one. She passed in 1941. And both of us went, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know what I think it is? I think it's just a little show of respect, just to stop for a minute and do like this and do this. Well, in our area of the country, when somebody gets sick that we know or has passed, we take over food. Have you noticed it? We take over food. You can buy that food. You can go to the deli and the grocery store, get something great, hire somebody to bake it, but put it down in the big list of important things for life. You get a lot more credit if you make it yourself. <laughs> you can put it on your grandmother's platter, but the women in the kitchen will say, I know where she got that chicken. I'm telling you, it works out that way. <laughs> and I make only one thing, and that is small little seven-up pound cakes. I make them by the dozen. I'm out of town, something happens, left brain takes it over. And not long ago, got up one morning and heard that a friend of ours was sick and went to my freezer and my pound cakes were depleted. I did not realize I was out. He said, I've been taking them to a lot of people. A lot of people been sick. I said, well, I didn't know they were gone. I got to get a pound cake made before I leave town. Honey, go to the grocery store and get my ingredients. He said, I'm trying to get to badminton. I said, well, it's just a few ingredients. He said, I tell you what. I can get there and get it and still get to badminton, but you make sure I can go through that express lane. No problem. We don't go to the grocery store together anymore because I frankly don't care what things cost by the half ounce. <laughs> so
So I made up the list and he left. Well, y'all, I waited. I waited. He didn't come back. I thought, he's gone on to badminton. And I thought, now where could he be? I was getting ready to call the grocery store and I heard the car pull in. He came huffing up the steps, had two sacks and more sacks hanging on his arms. He just glared at me, started putting stuff down, and said, I'll get some more out of the car. <laughs> I looked in the first sack, that was a pound of margarine, and two gigantic bottles of vanilla flavoring, doling out a half teaspoon of time. It would take forever <laughs> to get rid of these two gigantic bottles of vanilla flavor. And in the next sack were three dozen eggs. I said, they had a special. I'll tell you, they have had a special. I didn't need but five eggs. And I just said a dozen. In the next sack was a big old thing of shortening, two of them. And in the next sack, two more, 12 pounds of lard. <laughs> we could fry fish for everybody in here. But in that fourth sack, I found my list. And I'd like to step out of the kitchen just a minute to tell you something. <laughs> Left Brain is a smart man. He went to Duke University on a basketball scholarship, played basketball for four years, and graduated in the same four years. <laughs> then he went to Carolina and got a master's degree and a doctorate. He has over-degreed himself. <laughs> But I don't care how many pieces of paper you frame and put on the wall, if you have a left brain, it's going to kick in on you. And it kicked in on him about the third aisle of that grocery store. I'll step back in the kitchen. I found my list, and in my eagerness to make sure that he could get through the express ring, for probably the first time in my life, I numbered the items. <laughs> Number one, a pound of butter, no problem. Number two, large bottle of vanilla flavoring. I had two of them. Number three, a dozen eggs. This man has a doctorate degree. Number four, a big, big tub thing of lard. I could hear him coming back. I looked down at number five, said a five pound bag of sugar. I knew he was coming in with 25 pounds of sugar. And number six was a five pound bag of all purpose flour, 30 pounds of flour. Now, I believe in accepting things you can't change, but I also believe in hounding things sometimes. And then sometime I let it ride. And this time, y'all would have been proud of me. I let it ride. I put that list behind my back. He came in again, <laughs> plopping down sugar and flour all over, bam, 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 gets it all down there and says, one more trip. I went back to my list and looked, and number seven was a bottle of 7-Up. I don't want that big bottle because if you're going to make one cake and you just use it, it'll be stale by the time I get back. I told him I wanted a six-pack of those medium-sized ones hanging. So I knew he was coming back in with 42 bottles of 7-Up. And in a minute, there he was. I had just cleared a space for him right here. Back it up put them all down and turned around to me before he left and said, well, obviously, they wouldn't let me through the express lane. <laughs> but you know what? He got all the way out in the hall and came back and he said, for the record, I figured out what I had done. But by then she was ringing up the 7-Up. <laughs> and all these people behind me in line were laughing. And I got to get to badminton. Don't tell anybody. I said, I won't. Three days later, I went to the grocery store, and a woman that was checking me out says, I think I checked out your husband a few days ago. I said, I'm sure you could have. She said, that was an interesting order. I said, let me explain to you. And she was from this area, too, and this proves it, because I said, 
Anytime a friend of ours gets sick or has passed, and both of us went, <laughs> said, I make a pound cakes and we take it over. This woman said to me, is there an epidemic? 